Good evening, my name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. It looks like we have a new presidential administration coming in, assuming Donald Trump and his increasingly strange fellow travelers are unsuccessful in uncovering an anti-Trump conspiracy so diabolical that there is no evidence. So New York is turning its eyes to what we can expect from the administration of President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris as we face the triple whammy of the pandemic, the economic collapse it, 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 it engendered, and the uh, attempted reckoning with racial and economic inequality in policing, jobs, housing, immigration, what have you. In New York, hard hit by all three challenges, City Hall, Albany, and surrounding suburban counties are looking to a federal bailout to shore up a crumbling economic prospect, especially with the, especially with the MDA seeking a $12 billion infusion to rescue the region's life-sustaining capillaries. Biden's first appointments indicate he values experience and knowledge, which should work to our benefit. But if the Trump years taught us anything, it's that the old rules don't necessarily apply. Much depends on Georgia, where the two runoff elections in January could give Democrats control of the U.S. Senate with Harris as the tie-breaking vote. But whatever happens there, we're going into a new year still bedeviled by the pandemic-fueled crises, even as the nation tries to reassert leadership on the world stage, where we value allies and stop kowtowing to authoritarians. Locally, regionally, nationally, and globally, it's a time of hope. What can we expect? How should we temper our hopes as we prepare to bid a not so fond farewell to 2020 and to Donald Trump? We're joined by four New Yorkers who study and take part in public affairs as we enter the age of, of Biden. Yuli New is a state assembly member from Lower Manhattan 62nd District representing Chinatown, the financial district, Battery Park City and beyond. Lawrence Levy is a former Newsday colleague of mine and is the executive dean at the National Center for Suburban Studies at Hofstra University. Patria Delanza Julnes is the Associate Dean and Professor at the Mark School of Public and International Affairs at Baruch College. For the benefit of the right-wing Twitterverse, let me stress that is Marks with an E at the end. And Michael Benjamin is a member of the New York Post editorial board and the one-time Democratic Assemblyman from the Bronx, who will tell us what it all means. Yulene, let me begin with you. Um, you guys up in Albany where New York City and, and, and everybody depends very much on what you do, have been playing a very bad hand. Uh, there's no money, unlike the 1970s, the state can't bail out the city. Um, what, do you ex what do you hope for and what do you expect from a change in administration? Um, obviously, uh, there's been a lot of hope for revenue. Um, there's a lot of hope for a bailout um, of some sort from the federal government. Uh, I think that there, I mean, there is actually something that the state can do, which is to raise revenue in certain places. Um, and I'm hoping that we can do that regardless of the timing, um, because we do know that we do need federal funds, but we also know that we can't wait. Um, on the ground, what I'm seeing right now is just like sheer utter devastation. Um, my district is obviously uh, one that experienced the economic devastation a lot earlier than a lot of other places because of just sheer xenophobia, racism. And so we started to see that in Chinatown, uh, in lower Manhattan, um, and Chinatown in all the other enclaves within uh, the city. And um, it started to be really hard to see a lot of our small businesses uh, start to shutter. Um, folks who just couldn't make uh, the rent um, the commercial rent issue is really huge. Um, I have a bill on that. I think that it's really very hard to kind of watch this economic downturn and it's dominoes, right? Without our small businesses, we are also losing jobs without, you know, folks being employed, you know, you have a huge need for social services and then you see cuts across the board for social services, for the things that we need. And it's just devastating thing after devastating thing. And so um, right now we just have an urgency. And so we desperately need the financial uh, help. Um, we need the economic help that our state and our city and our federal government all need to help us with, so. Oh, uh, Larry, this is not a city only problem. Um, no. You know, we you just went through the elections and kind of by and large Republicans and Democrats held serve on Long Island. Uh, you know, even as the even as 
Democrats now have a veto-proof majority in Albany, in the Senate, which may not be what Andrew Cuomo really wants. Um, the kind of impacts that we've seen in the city, you've seen on uh, you've seen on Long Island, especially with the MTA, which is the lifeblood lifeblood of the entire region. How's this being? How is this playing out? Other than all the New Yorkers who have moved out to the east end of Long Island, I mean, how you know how is this playing out on the island and the suburbs more generally? Well, the pandemic has uh, been devastating. Um, uh, all the more so in, in communities of color. Uh, the COVID rates uh, in the beginning uh, of the pandemic on Long Island were almost as high as they were in New York City. And that's a reality of life in the suburbs. Uh, I use this expression that's become a cliche already, but it's not my mother and father's suburb. And uh, I mean, it's changing so quickly out in uh, not just Long Island, but suburbs across the country that it's not even my kids' suburbs and they're in their 30s. Uh, the pace of demographic change has uh, caused all kinds of uh, changes in uh, community makeup, uh, uh, its economics, uh, its racial and, and ethnic mix. Um, and the fact that uh, the suburbs that my parents moved to, which were absolutely brand new, I mean, down to the sewage systems underneath the streets, are aging. And because of the fragmentation in suburban communities, you can't deal with it in the same collective way, say, a city could. So you, it's gets harder and harder to uh, remediate uh, uh, major infrastructure issues. At the same time, just one other thing about life in the suburbs, you know, this myth of, the, uh, of, of wealth and wellness in suburban communities. Uh, there are more poor people out in the suburbs now than in central cities, more new immigrants than in central cities, and just as many and in some cases, more problems with the environment and other issues that we used to call that people used to flee the cities uh, to come to the island. Uh, so the county executives, the superintendents of our 10 million school districts are all desperately looking south to Washington. Um, uh, the, the great hope uh, um, among suburbanites uh, who often feel shortchanged, whether it's true or not, some things it is, sometimes it's not, uh, by, by state and federal government, is that Joe Biden is a true prince of the suburbs. He uh, 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 was born in an exurb, uh, grew up in an exurb, but he lived for 30 some odd years as a commuter on the uh, Delaware version of the Long Island Railroad. On Amtrak, yes. Uh, live with these folks. Uh, it's in his, I don't want to, you know, another cliche in his DNA, but one of the reasons I believe Barack Obama picked him as a vice president was not just his foreign policy chops. Actually, I did a column for the Times on this in 2008, but because he needed somebody with suburban sensibilities. And why is that important? Because whoever carries the suburbs for over a generation now gets the keys to the White House and control of the gavels in Congress. And if you want to come up with legislation that sort of passes the compromise test of a middle ground, look for how it plays in the suburbs because that's where a preponderance of moderate voters are. Patria, um, I think Larry makes an important point about the, you know Trump's image of the suburbs was a white housewife waiting for her husband to get, a, to get his job back, which is, I mean, Ozzy and Harriet may still live there, but they're now great grandparents. Um, but there's an overlay. When you look at what's happened with, with COVID, there's an overlay with race, with ethnicity, with who are the, who are the, uh, who are the essential workers. There's high correlations between all those factors in the suburbs, in the city, and that's not gonna, that's not gonna change with a new administration. Well, if, if you're asking me, uh, I, I, I uh... I wrote a column for our friend Rich Gallen over at CNN, another former Newsday guy who now runs their opinion section, back in the summer where I said, like a lot of other people, frankly, this wasn't an original thought, that Trump was acting out of a 50s and 60s playbook and right. appealing to suburbanites who didn't exist. But as the summer turned into fall and the convention turned into what was not, not a pivot to to the center, which is candidates on both sides tend to do. I realized that 
he, he knew exactly what he was doing. He yeah, was yeah. not appealing to suburban moderates. He was appealing to every single person, mm -hmm. whether they lived in the city, the suburbs, or in rural areas, who thinks like he did. He was going to win only with his base wherever they lived. Well, so I, his message certainly resonated with some of my neighbors who, right. because he got 50% of the vote in Suffolk and 42 maybe in, in Nassau. And what did he get, 22% in New York City? Which is actually, cool. but let me go to, let me go to Pachia for a second on, on that overlay, you know, that lack of that, you know, that 1950s vision is quite dated, but how does that inform how we should be looking at what we, you know, what we want going forward, assuming we have a vaccine and assuming that we get the opportunity mm -hmm. to start to rebuild? Well, I whether we get a vac we are going to have a vaccine. I mean, that's just no question about it. But one, one of the problems that particularly New York City is going to confront is that you have a, part a population, especially just uh, those uh, migrant populations that are key to, they were the ones that we were clapping, remember at 7 p.m. every night in New York City, and they are key to the food chain of uh, New York City. And yet that particular population is housing insecure, is healthcare insecure, is everything insecure. And some of them, yes, are also are undocumented, but they are working. And they would be going to work even though they don't have healthcare, but they have to go because otherwise they will lose their job. And if they lose their job, they lose housing. And guess what? Many of them also have children at home who are American citizens who are also housing and food insecure. And I think that uh, whoever, uh, I am very hopeful that Biden is going to be uh, working towards something about immigration that, uh, that is going to reverse the structural racism that has been built into our system for the, for the past four years and from before, of course. It's not just the uh, past four years, but New York City is going to have to work really hard because housing is a problem. And no matter what administration is in, in, in Washington, New York State is gonna to have to do something about food insecurity, housing insecurity, and healthcare. Because part of the problem is that we have all these policies uh, in, in New York, and yet what we are going to, what we're having is uh, this um, social, what we call the social determinants of health that are really negatively affecting these populations that are integral to our transit, to our food supply, to everything except, of course, the high luxury condominiums. They are, they don't live there. So we really need to, uh, to do something. And it's true. So Trump was appealing to everybody. And some people said Hispanics, uh, well, or Latinos, some people called them voted for him. But no, 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 no. Let's, let's just be honest. First of all, Hispanics are not a block. You know, we don't vote as a block. And if anything, Republicans lost their chance because if you look at just because of religious beliefs and the abortion stuff, Hispanics should be conservatives. Right. And they're not, you know, right. they're not. So it's, we are a very diverse group. However, in general, very discriminated. And we're going to have to do something about that, regardless of the administration in Washington. New York City has to take this seriously because we are in a big crisis. Michael, our, our, I mean, our expectations are very high. Are they about the change in administration? Are they unrealistic? I mean, you know, at some point the laws of the, you know, the laws of economics apply. Well, two things I think we need to look at first. Joe Biden will be the first president in, I guess, since um, Gerald Ford to come directly out of Congress, at least be a few years out of Congress. So he has a connection to the members of, the, of Congress, of the Senate especially. Uh, he also faces the possibility of a de Republican controlled Senate. Mm -hmm. and unless the Democrats win both seats in a Georgia runoff, He's going to have a hard time getting many of the conservative Republicans to agree to a very large, you know, multiple trillion dollar bailout for the, for the nation. So he's going to have to use every one of his political skills. He's going to have to become LBJ uh, for the civil rights era, for this era, for, for the post-COVID era, to get the money that the cities, that the, the cities need. Mm -hmm. but, but the question, let me, let me stick with you, Michael. At the same time, I mean, Biden, you know, this is kind of crass politics. LBJ is a wonderful, 
you know, you know, is a, you know, it's probably a wonderful analogy because you're already seeing um, Biden saying, I know Mitch McConnell, I've dealt with him for all, you know, I've dealt with him for all these years, you know, maybe I can do business with him where, you know, once the specter of Trump, the heavy hand of this, you know, you know, kind of uh, strange authority, you know, look, fortunately incompetent authoritarian is removed from the stage and you don't have, you know, the, he was very non-cooperative with Obama, but, but, you know, but you're right. Biden's, Biden is a creature of Washington. Does that help us? I believe it does. Uh, because we're going to need much more than what Biden's housing plan and other plans that he put out during the campaign uh, can actually afford. I mean, as you mentioned earlier, the MTA wants $12 billion. That, that's like a tenth of, uh, of Biden's housing plan. Uh, New York City, uh, public housing in New York needs $24 billion to bring it up to 21st century code and protecting the lives of the residents who live there. So it's a lot of money, and he's going to need to use every ounce of his political skill and that of his vice president, uh, Ms. Harris, Kamala Harris, to, to get Congress to move in the right direction and in a timely fashion. I want to also add, I was in the assembly during the 2008 financial crisis, the, the nation faced you know, near bankruptcy and a near depression. And uh, we needed to find all of our resources, with the help from D.C. And in, and in New York, to make sure we stayed on our feet. But may I just say, Bob, as well, it's just, I'm just going to say, you know, I, I, I would hope that actually Joe Biden can influence Congress, but Congress is not Congress as it's supposed to be. You know, there's no collaboration. The Congress where there was collaboration is gone. I think that uh, if, if the Democrats don't get Georgia, Biden is just going to have to rule through uh, executive order. I mean, and we do know that that just goes so far, but I am sorry, but I'm very skeptical about the goodwill of the people of Congress in the Republican Party because they haven't shown any, any desire to actually help uh, the American citizens. So but why just, we, we expect that they're going to change now? But you can't use executive orders to move the budget. You can't move trillions of dollars in the American budget by executive order. You have to really get the buy-in of, every member of, of the Congress, because you want, it's a national crisis. Everybody's been affected by the pandemic. So they need to be leaders and need to come together for the sake of the nation. Whether it's a, a $50 trillion package or it's a $35 trillion package, we need to get something done and we need mm -hmm. to use politics and whatever comedy that the, uh, the, the president-elect has with, with his former colleagues in, in Congress. Mm -hmm. You'll need every ounce of it, and you need the support of the American people to put pressure on the member of Congress and on their, mm -hmm. on, on their, their senators. Of course, even if the Democrats take the Senate, you know, Albany is probably the perfect example, where you have everybody in the same party. That doesn't mean that they get along and, can, exactly. mm -hmm. and you have ideological battles within party caucus. Eileen, you've been a veteran now of the wars. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, you know, and, and the governor you know, actually is in a much stronger position institutionally than a president is relative to the Congress. You know, executives in this, in the city and state have more power than a president does mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, you know, I mean, even setting the revenue estimate, which, you know, defines how much money you can, you can budget. Is there, you know, is there a lesson of how you guys have had to work this out compared to what we can expect down there? I mean, I think that, you know, in our state, uh, for, for the students who are here, you know, look up what Silver V Pataki is, right? I think that a lot of folks can understand, like, the reason why we have what's called a strong governor state. Um, and, you know, that there's, um, there's a very uh, real power there um, when it comes to our budget and our uh, revenue, um, our possibility for raising any revenue, et cetera. I think that all of those things um, are uh, determined a lot uh, due to Silver V. Pataki by our governor. You know, like you just said, mm. he determines what, we, what parameters we work within. Um, he also determines, uh, you know, how much, um, 
you know, he, he has a very arbitrary 2% cap, for example, on our budget. And then now he's also the one to kind of tell us, you know, what we can and cannot do. Um, and, and he's also withholding money. So one of the things that is very interesting um, that, you know, folks probably don't realize is that there is currently an issue with a lot of the social services, like a lot of our nonprofits are actually not getting paid out. Right. The money that they already are supposed to be getting through RFP, through the budget that we passed, and he could just withhold it with, you know, DOB or with um, whatever agency that he feels like. And then later on, you're going to see this gap within the budget, right? You're going to see like, wow, this money wasn't actually sent out and then what does he do with it then he says like oh well this wasn't needed because it wasn't spent and then what happens to those dollars and then what happens to um reallocating those dollars right so then it becomes a um it, it's uh, for better or worse like <laughs> it, it, it it tells a different story than what is actually happening and so um it it actually hurts our nonprofit organizations it hurts you know what's happening on the ground um right now you know, our NORCs, our, for, for folks who don't know the acronym, it's Naturally Occurring Retirement Communities, um, our nonprofit organizations um, on the ground, the settlement houses, all of these different organizations who are literally the ones who are out there delivering food, out there making sure that folks have, you know, that, um, that extra help they need. They are the social safety net. They are the ones who know how to reach people right now and specifically the most vulnerable. Yet they're the ones who are getting cuts or ha having their funding withheld or not being able to pay their staff um, who are the ones who are actually able to service the folks that need it the most. And so we're seeing that um, happening on the ground right now as we speak. And we are also seeing this strange allocation of funds in the strangest ways, right? And we're seeing it on the state level, we're seeing it on the city level, or obviously seeing it on the federal level. I can't even talk about all the things that happened with the PAU and the PPP and all those things. But on the state level, we are seeing that, you know, the allocation of funds have um, been redistributed in a, in a strange way, but then on the city level, for example, they've been completely re, re uh, you know, re drawing the wheel, re recreating the wheel on certain things such as food, right? Everything has to go through DIFTA now. Everything is like, you know, the free meals, et cetera. People are waiting for hours to get these free meals. And those meals are full of milk and applesauce and crackers and, um, you know, just things that, if you are a person with diabetes, you could never eat. If you are a person who has renal failure or something like that, you could never eat. And yet our settlement houses and our nonprofit organizations, all of these folks who have been doing these things with senior centers, et cetera, knew exactly what to do. And yet their funding was cut so that they can't provide those things. We didn't expand it. And we instead uh, are recreating these programs that are literally getting these huge contracts from these corporations that are making it so that they're making more money when people are, you know, not actually, it's, it's, just a, it's a vicious cycle that's just happening, right? And what we could have done was we could have had an expanded SNAP program. We could have had different kinds of programs that made it so that people had cash-like, um, you know, services and, uh, or are able to use cash to be able to go and support our small businesses, make it so that, you know, our grocery stores, et cetera, in the neighborhoods were actually being used. Our delis were being used, you know, and like people knew where to get food from. They have their own dietary preferences. They could have been culturally appropriate. And yet none of the things that um, were given were culturally appropriate, you know, nutritious, um, you know, it, it's just a cycle that keeps on going. And I can't really reiterate how badly um, things were managed through this entire crisis, uh, except that, you know, what I'm seeing is that, you know, we are starting these mutual aid organizations, we're starting all of these different, you know, small operations of our you know, restaurants, making sure that they can provide nutritionally, um, you know, sufficient foods, having these come from private donations, having it come from like, you know, our friends and neighbors, you know, where the government has not stepped up on the federal side, on the state side, on the city side, our neighbors have. And so that's where, you know, things have been, it have been really painful because um, I think it's history of austerity budgeting throughout, right? It's become the norm. And so you're seeing that on the state level, you're seeing it through this strong governor state, you're seeing it um, kind of be uh, the only way that we can budget uh, because of the way that we are structured. And um, and un I guess until, until we have the numbers to actually change that, we're not able to change the way that we budget. And so um, I think that it's been really, uh, encouraging to see a lot of the electoral shift. We've seen the electoral shift um, in the Senate, right, for example, and we are going to have a supermajority for the very first time um, 
in, I don't know, since I, Michael Benjamin might know, but not since those. I don't remember ever having a Ever uh, having one. Yeah, they haven't had really? I, I, Neither uh, party. Right. Well, Larry, I, and, I, and that's where I think it's really exciting. If you, right? if you think the super majority is going to make a, a smidgen of difference, you're dreaming. Yeah. Uh, Cuomo is more skillful than any 10 people up there put together, mm -hmm. whether you like them or not. You don't have to like somebody to acknowledge their skills. And uh, uh, Bob, I think, uh, 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 alluded to this earlier, um, it, it, holding together uh, a, a whole conference that includes members from suburban Syracuse and not to mention Long Island and Westchester who uh, are, are, you know, have enormous number of moderate and independent voters uh, he will be able to maneuver uh, and and uh, basically have his way in whatever way he wants. I, I don't see anything changing. Um, the um, uh, if you pull the lens back a little bit, um, you know, get back to maybe a you know ten or twenty thousand foot view. Um, there are about forty at most fifty con competitive congressional seats in the country. Both parties would agree. And virtually every one of them is wholly or substantially suburban. And when the major parties, when, when a, a left or right winger from a major party somehow happens to win a primary there, they generally, there are exceptions, but they generally lose. So these guys are much less concerned about the left or right wings than the moderate voters in their midst. And these are the people, Republican and Democrat, and this may be a total fantasy, even more than dominating Cuomo with a supermajority, but uh, uh, they are the people around whom, if at all, compromises can be found to at least move along. You won't get Medicare for all. You won't get some other uh, uh, projects, at least the, you know, the Green Deal, the way it was originally proposed. I want to go to a question. But, but you, you can get relatively relatively, I stress the word relatively progressive legislation that moves the dial a little bit until you know, the left can make a, a, a better case to moderate voters for some very important things that need to be done, but uh, got you know, slowed down, I think, by the intemperate, some intemperate language, like defund right. police and right. socialism. Right. You know, my mother was a socialist. She was a card-carrying socialist, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. I don't think she would use that word today if she wanted to, you know, try to get ahead even in a union. So, I, you know, I, when I grew up in the 1960s, people warned of creeping socialists. They said I was more the creeping than the socialist. But it was, <laughs> I do want to go to a, I, I do want to go to a question from the student. But I want to just touch on one point. A lot of the things that Eulene was talking about, a lot of the things that Pachi was talking about. Um, and talking about how you get thing, how you actually get things done, is it requires money, and and that is why we are so dependent on what happens and what happens in Washington. You already start to see the independent budget office came out with a bunch of revenue enhancers in this city, including a Pieta tear tax. I think I think Patrick, you talked about the you know high end, you know you know the high end housing that. You know, look, you know, Larry, you say that, you know, Long Island is behind the eight ball. It wasn't that long ago that Long Island drove the bus um, and, and, you know, in Albany to what a lot of people feel is the detriment of the city. Sure. When you had a Republican Senate, they were the obstructionists. No, no question about it. And they were even out of step with their own constituents and just stayed one step ahead of annihilation by gerrymandering. And they won't be able mm -hmm. to do it again. Right. right. So uh, uh, let, uh, let me go to Kafui Kuaku. If you have a question from a, if you have a question from a student, come on in. Hello, hello. Hello. I'm trying to get my video to come back. This is where you. 
Well, while we're waiting, um, Bob, I just wanted okay. to say, you know, that the uh, the the revenue raisers that have been uh, proposed, we could technically, you know, if we're doing a multimillionaire's tax, a billionaire's tax, um, the stock buyback transfer tax, the stock transfer tax, if we're doing all of these different things, there is a there is a way to raise certain revenues, right? So just I just wanted to put that out there. There there are some packages in that um, in that the state can do certain things to raise revenue. I would be remiss not to let Michael respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, my from, my pers- in Albany. <laughs> yes. from, from my perspective, having been there in 2008 with yeah. financial collapse, one of the things Shelley told the conference as he was discussing the dire situation of the state budget is that we cannot afford to kill the golden goose. And that golden goose is and remains Wall Street, the, uh, mm-hmm. the financiers, the banks. Those are the guys who are most mobile and can really lo- relocate themselves, their business and their homes out of New York State and uh-huh. still make money. Um, so, and even from the I first perspective, I'm sorry. I, I know, I, I understand all, all that, but, 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 but there, there are ways of raising revenue that does not require, as Shelley would say, would have said, yeah. killing, killing the golden goose. Um, oh, and we've written we are, about Michael. it. The, the Post has written a number, a number of editorials about that, wanting to find some way of preserving the tax base and focusing on growing the economy and growing it not through excessive taxation, but through economic growth. And, it's, and that's something that the federal government could be helpful with in helping to, in my view, as a Democrat, priming the pump and getting mm-hmm. things get, getting things moving. You know, one out of three uh, small businesses in New York are facing the prospect of never reopening. And that's not good for the workers who they provided yes. incomes to. Yeah, but that's not well, Susie. I'm sorry. I have to, I have to disagree because that is not you don't help the small business by helping wall street i'm sorry because we have been helping wall street for way too many years and look where we are look where we are with a huge huge housing and food insecurity not only that see when we close the school let's just put it out there the richest cities in the world when we close the school children don't have food to eat because where do they get their meals at school how is that possible? And then we say that we have a golden goose. I'm sorry, but that golden goose hasn't been laying eggs for us. Something is wrong and something has to be revisited. It has been laying eggs for somebody, but we have a huge food insecurity and, we, and, and housing insecurity. We really have to address that. It's been laying eggs for themselves. And <laughs> on top of that, I just want to say that I now represent the district that Shelly represented and it includes Wall Street. <laughs> so so I, 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 I wrote editorials at Newsday for a long time, and we were always as, uh, advocating uh, uh, income redistribution for, for a very long time to a suburban readership, which didn't think that was such a wonderful thing. But I have to tell you that there, that there is a little bit of truth in the idea of, of killing the golden goose. Um, when you have 50% of all the income taxes paid in the state by a handful of people, It doesn't take a lot of them leaving. By the same token, most studies have shown, to the extent, and they're flawed, but have shown that very few super wealthy leave because the impact on them is is not all that much. And frankly, they're not interested in how it affects themselves so much as how it affects their employees. And not many of their employees are... um, are, are, are super wealthy. I, I have a friend, I, I'll admit to, who raised a lot of money for Donald Trump. He had him at his house, raised over a million dollars. And uh, he calls me up uh, uh, last year and he says, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done with Trump, I'm done with the Republicans. I said, why? He says, so, state and local deductibility. I said, and I won't say his name, I said, well, that probably saves you a million bucks a year. He says, no, it costs me several million. I said, why? Right. He says, because, because it's killing my employees. And if I want to keep them and I'm in a very competitive business, I got to pay more. So he, was, he resigned his, his position in the Republican Party because this was killing him, because it was killing his employees. So right. it's very complicated. And I, I don't disparage the golden goose, but I also realize that we can re- redistribute income a lot better than we have to. And I know that we have to get to questions, but Larry, I, I just wanted to say that and plug in that I have some of the wealthiest people living right here, and they have called me literally saying the exact same thing mm-hmm. that it's costing them more, and that they're and, and it's actually um, they're telling me to tax them. This question is 
from uh, Mark Trier, a 2020 graduate of Borough College, Mark School of Public and International Affairs, and also a retired member of the FDNY. With cities around uh, worldwide, and especially here in New York, under extreme financial pressure due to the current pandemic, what do you see as the most critical focus of municipal spending? And could you identify a revenue source to pay for it? It's kind of what, what we've, you know, what we've been talking about it. You know, it, you know, the, the, identifying the problems are easy. Finding the answers is, are hard. That's, you know, that's what always, and you know, we're talking to a audience of CUNY students who potentially face increased tuition, fewer, you know, fewer professors, fewer uh, part-time professors, you know, fewer teaching um, um, adjuncts. Adjunct. And so, you know, I mean, this is, you know, the rubber is beating the road right now. How do you, you know, what do you cut? What do you raise? Mm -hmm. or, I mean, anybody want to jump in? It's a, you know, you know it's, a, it's a very, very tough question. Bob, it's the MTA. The MTA is the most important agency in New York City, New York State right now. It, that's going to get our workers back to work. It's going to move, it's gonna, it's gonna move commuters from, from the suburbs into the city. It's going to move city folks to their jobs in Manhattan and in Brooklyn and the, and the Bronx and Queens. The proper funding of the MTA is what's important, whether it's $12 billion or the $24 billion that's being asked, but it's the MTA, in my view, ought to be the, the priority. Well, yeah. I think that's one of the priorities because but you need to have people who can actually go and use the MTA and people who can actually, who are healthy enough and who can go and drive the buses. If they're not, they are hungry, they're, they're not healthy, they can't go. So the other thing, you need to spend money, for example, on getting those uh, the schools with the appropriate PPE so that the kids can go back to school, that the teachers can feel safe. You need to start open the economy in a very healthy, in a, in a, uh, in an, uh, using investment the way, for example, that South Korea invested money. But you can't just tell people, oh yeah, go to the, go, go back to school or go take a, the train when they are not protected. So we need to spend money on making sure that people can be safe as they are using the MTA as they are going to school, as they are going to work. And we need to do this in a very systematic way. Only if we do that, we start opening the economy safely, can we start really uh, raising revenues. But we need to take care of those pesky issues of housing, food insecurity, and healthcare. But, and but, if you have the job, you can have a job. If, you, if you're not healthy, you can't go to work. But there's, there's, a, there's a fundamental question that has to be asked before you can talk about specific programs and strategies. Do you believe that what we're going through is short term or does it represent some sort of paradigm shift that will require a completely different way of, of living? Um, I think that it's, it, that it, because if it is the latter, you've got to start doing some very different things than if it's the former. If it's the former and you think it's short term, then you then I would say you borrow that as much money as you possibly can to get through it and you pay it out of future revenue. It's already not short term. Yeah. Precisely that, you know, precisely that point, you know, under the rubric of never let a good crisis go to waste. Yeah. How do you, is it a time because of the depth of this crisis, uh, which is, you know, deeper than anything we've gone through in our lifetimes? You know, we're, I'm a child of, you know, uh, parents who went through the depression. But this is, in our lifetime, this is the deepest, the shortest, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a short jolt, but we can rethink how we come out of it. And, you know, you look at Biden talking about investment in infrastructure, but also investing in climate change technology, mm -hmm. creating new jobs, new types of jobs, shifting away from, from, you know, shifting away from the oil, from, you know, fossil, from fossil fuels. There are creative opportunities. So I just... Yes, go ahead. I just wanted to kind of connect the thoughts a little bit. So, um, I, and, and shout out to the Baruch, 
bear cat. Um, I just, <laughs> I also wanted to say that, you know, I want to also shout out my economics professor from Baruch, who is amazing, Mr. <laughs> Sanders, just want to put it out there. Um, he is awesome. And he's going to be very proud of me for saying this because it's basic economics. And um, I'm really glad about what Larry said earlier. And I also wanted to say that, you know, yes, it is a question of whether or not it's short term and long term, but it's already been long term. And I want to say that we already, um, I, and I, and I, and I, and I said this in my speech on the floor in March, and I said this um, over and over and over again as we continued on racking up the uh, exponential growth of, of need that we're experiencing as, um, as time has gone on, right? Because I will say that if we were to have invested in our infrastructure starting in March. If we were to actually have, you know, invested in our healthcare, in our education mm -hmm. system, in our transportation, in all of the things that would have built a safety net for us to be able to have a, have a swift recovery, we would be in a very different place right now. If we had not had austerity budget, like after austerity budget for the last however long, right? We would have been in a very different position right now. I'm talking about like countries like Taiwan, for example, right? Taiwan has literally had seven deaths total. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Their, eco their economy has already had never stopped a beat. Like their eco economy hasn't stopped a beat. They are able to recover perfectly fine, right? So, so our, our, our recovery has exponentially grown. The cost of our recovery has exponentially grown. By the end of June, it has doubled. By the end of September, it doubled again. Now it's gonna double again. You know, and that's going to be a cost that we're not going to be able to afford soon. And so if we're not going to raise the revenue, if we're not going to make those, those investments in our community right now, then we're going to have a devastating economy that is going to, we're going to see the repercussions of it for a decade or so. This is going to be a lost generation for education. This is going to be a lost generation for, for work. People's, it's already happening, right? Small businesses have shut down forever. Mm -hmm. Right. There are businesses in my district that survived Hurricane Sandy, have survived 9-11, that, that survived so many huge crises, but they couldn't survive this. Mm -hmm. There are so many businesses that have been able to, to help our economy regrow again here down in lower Manhattan, and yet they're gone. And there are people who have lost their jobs and who can't find jobs and are going to have a segment of their life where they have no employment. Right, we we've seen that with our my generation, right, where people were, um, you know, coming out with their degrees and not being able to find a job. You know, this is when actually Michael will probably talk about it a little bit because he was actually in office at the time. And so, like these are these are times when we were having a hard time adjusting. Now we're going to see that um, play out in a way that is snowball is snowball affecting, right? And but so challenging times require us to get tougher. I mean, at primitive New York City, at primitive world, survive the Spanish influenza, which, 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 which killed millions of people. Mm -hmm. We're not even close to that yet. We, we have more scientific knowledge. I've been going to work on the subway since this thing started. We don't have to be afraid. We can make things work. We can make things safe. We need to just let our economy grow. Let us grow out of both the pandemic and grow out of the economic crisis. We can't hide in our bunkers and in our homes and, and on our cell phone cameras talking to each other. We have to be out in the world, building things again and doing the things that humans do. Humans require we be out in the world and disease will always be with us. Disease is, is, will kill us. Disease is important. It keeps the, the equilibrium, the natural equilibrium that, that's out there. Stop being afraid. Rebuild our economy. Support the Biden administration. Support what's going to go on in Congress in 2021 to get us back on our feet whether you want to redistribute income or whatever you want to do, we need to get people back to work and grow the economy. And that's how we properly redistribute income. And that's how we make sure children don't go, don't go unfed, don't go uneducated. Schools were open during the Spanish influenza. Kids went to school. They used PPE that was existing at the time. We can live through this. We can't just be captured by our fear. Stop being afraid. Go back to work. We just... Uh, oh, we lost him. We lost, uh, ah. we lost Michael. Um, yeah. yeah, but I mean, just to answer, yeah, just to answer that back a little bit. Oh, go ahead. By the way, I've wanted to mute Michael. It's one of the first times that I've. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, oh. just to, just to answer and go back to that question, the main question of like, what is it that um, you know we should be investing in? Um, and and I, my 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 uh, answer would be very very 
uh, maybe a little bit opposite to Michael's in the sense that I think that we need to be investing in housing right now. Like we need to make sure that people can pay their rent. And um, I do think that it's really important that we are, if we are asking people to stay home for healthcare reasons, and by the way, right now we are learning so much that we are interconnected in a way that humans are interconnected in a way we've always been interconnected in so many different ways that um, this is a time when it's, the light has been shown even brighter that my healthcare is dependent on your healthcare, your healthcare is dependent on my healthcare. You know, my wealth is, depend on your wealth like my healthiness is depend on yours and so like this is where you know everything is so interconnected now that yes like if we are asking people to stay home then we should be helping to make sure that they have homes to stay in mm -hmm. and we should be making sure that they are actually able to afford it and that and then we need to make sure that you know they can get the get the resources that they need to be able to stay home so that the rest of us can get back to work and you know make sure that we can get that going right i think that there's just so many answers there um and i think that the student asked a really good question let me uh, let me jump over to kafui for another question the next question is uh from abigail rojas from the borough of manhattan community college and the question is when thinking of the city as a place that could run on clean and renewable energy, how can our legislators ensure that everyone embarks on the journey regardless of their economic status? And will currently under-resourced community also receive the help that's necessary to run on clean energy? That's the creative opportunity that's, you know, that's going on. Go ahead, go ahead, Pacio. You look like you wanted to jump in. No. Um what he was talking about, uh, particularly those uh, communities who are uh, the low income communities, I was trying to figure out, well, who is going to bring in or who's going to help them? Because what we have found is that particularly in places where we have high pollution, you have a high percentage of people who live uh, uh, under low incomes. So they are being uh, structurally already, they are being discriminated. So who, is, who has a responsibility to come in? Well, the city needs to make sure that there is a, a plan and a plan that is implemented, but that it is carried all by all. So know that, so not just the community in Long Island get, you know, get the, uh, the means to be able to run on clean energy, but also the communities that are uh, uh, less affluent. And this is the problem. That's not what we do. We usually go to the most affluent and they already have the wherewithal, and we do not put the resources where the less affluent people are. I mean, so, one question, Larry, is that endless proposals for wind farms in Long Island Sound. I mean, when we're, you know, we're talking about moving, you know, in a creative way to, you know, change the way we power our homes, power our economy. Does that thing still exist? Oh yeah, the state uh, let two billion dollars worth of uh, contracts. Uh, to two international companies. Uh, they're here now. They're starting their pre-construction work. Um, one of the good things, at least from my perspective, is that they are immediately devoting some effort to understanding uh, the income inequality out here and the uh, trying to create some opportunities in advance for communities of color, working with some of the community colleges, uh, some of the traditionally poor, um, uh, African-American and Latino communities to make sure that there are opportunities. I was actually you know, glad that they've sensitized, they're actually working with, a, with Hofstra on some of that uh, in the Nassau County portion of it. But yeah, green energy is, is our future. I mean, there's no question about it. The real, the real question is um, you know, kind of the flip side of environmental racism. I mean, poor communities got the, again, another cliche, the short end of the stick um, when it came to the location of these fixed-based power plants. We have to make sure that A, we're not just loading up even the green versions of them uh, in, in communities that already are beset with other uh, uh, stresses on their quality of life and, 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 and land values, personal wealth. Um, but we also need to make sure that um, the, the, there are career pathways and that mm -hmm. education is a curriculum is revamped to, to reflect the new jobs of the future. And if you don't start that in K-12, um, these kids are gonna lose out in the competition for jobs because, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, because of the reason they always do. But Larry- lack of Networks, I mean, lack of training. Could I just uh, follow with Larry? Because I just wanna make sure that, 
you see, not everything that is going to be needed, for example, is going to be taught in college. We really need to make sure that people right. start going to those uh, vocational uh, schools that can give those kind of skills for jobs directly for those kind of jobs that you're talking about. Because I think that we, and oh my gosh, and this is terrible to say because obviously I'm an associate dean and I want more students, but let's be honest. There are jobs where you don't need a college degree and it could be much more lucrative for some people and people need to be doing what they can do best. And so we really need to be encouraging a wide variety of uh, access to education and supporting that from training to education. I think that well, we really a, need to do that. As a fellow academic, I have a guilt-free compromise idea for you. Okay. Um, uh, for a while, I ran the 5,000 student continuing ed world at Hofstra University, and more and more of our students were not college students. They were high school students mm -hmm. who were work getting uh, training for skills or maybe a, a path to a degree. Uh, uh, on Saturdays, we were getting non-traditional students coming in. Uh, I think that community colleges and four-year colleges mm -hmm. should, like newspapers had to do, you know, you, you're, you're now a news organization, you're not a paper. You don't just print in paper, you do it online as well. Well, colleges have to recognize that we have infrastructure, we have a, an ability to teach people, they don't have to only be 18 to 22 year olds. Mm -hmm. well, what great. exactly is the renewable energy job require? We talk about installing solar, solar panels, or actually building them where they're built in, in Japan. It's any, oh, we it's talk about anything. wind turbines. It's, it's everything. It's everything from traditional construction mm -hmm. where the skills you teach them for green energy can help them put in a, in a, 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 an addition on a house. Um, yeah, so all the way, so all the way we're on not up about, PH, PhD jobs. So they're not really new skills we're talking about. They're the same old skills just being transferred to a, to a, to a new kind of economy. Well, I'm a nuclear, I'm a nuclear energy guy. I don't understand why the governor closed Indian Point. He wants to bring hydropower, which is going to take forever to come down to Hudson. Uh, the, the governor has no real plan. We, we criticize it constantly in, in the post when it comes to his energy plan. We need to look at, as, as President Obama had done, looking at what's going to be the bridge to the future. And that's going to be natural gas. That's going to be nuclear power. And that's going to be some, some form of hydroelectric. Uh, in, in, in being renew and doing renewables. And also, we don't even have a, 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 an infrastructure to make renewables possible, make it even possible for owners of electric vehicles to charge their cars overnight if their renters living in an apartment building. Persons, mm -hmm. persons living home they have it easy. Um, so we have to put those sort of things in place. And maybe that's what we should be asking the Biden administration to, to put into place as we look at revitalizing and re-energizing the national economy. But again, you know, you, those skills that are being taught for these new technologies, which is the bridge, which, which is the bridge of the future. It's a time, you know, as we're out on our butts because of the pandemic, we should, it's, it's kind of like the mayor said, okay, I'm going to close the schools. He didn't figure out that he actually had to reopen the schools at some point. He didn't get, get to that plan. You know, this is a this is a time for planning, and this is a time, frankly, when I think you know I I think you're both right, Patria and um, and Larry, that that, that 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 training in college and in high school should be aimed at these new technologies, not just the installation jobs. We should be producing, you know, you know, we should be manufacturing those elements. Mm -hmm. And shameless and plug, shameless plug. I just want to say that you know Stony Brook has been one of the the leading uh, thought leaders on a lot of the green uh, job production. You know, and some well, of those I'll things. Say Oscar has too, but it's okay. okay. <laughs> some of those things, you know, we're talking about mechanics, but we're also talking, you know, now and now we're using microchips, so you can't just go and get a hammer. You know, it's not just a hammer. You need to have there some specialized skills that need to be taught. And they may, may be at college, but community college are a perfect place and vocational schools to teach these things. And so it is not the same old skills. We really need to revamp and rethink how we see and what kind of things are, where are we gonna build it? Who is gonna build it? Why are we importing it when we have so many people without jobs that can start building things now? 
in this country. And there are and industry record uh, recognized certifications that people just have to get, whether right. it's, you know, it's different levels of OSHA certification, uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, tech jobs, uh, they, you know, they all have all alphabet soup of, of, of descriptions, but, you know, you, 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 it's not just, as you say, driving a nail with a hammer. Um, you need to understand a lot of technology about the hammer and the nail. Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of technology microchips are actually built by other computers. They're built and designed by other computers. And I, I feel like I've been living in a, in a time of the last 40 years. 40 years ago, we had a discussion around the skills mismatch. It's the same discussion. When are we going to move forward and actually make things happen rather than mm -hmm. continually spinning, spinning, spinning our wheels, wondering when things are going to improve? You don't think things, things have changed in the last 40 years? Well, not what absolute, I'm hearing. But, but, not what I'm hearing shift. but not what I'm hearing from the, from the, from the two professors. They, they still no, think no, 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 need no. to have I mean, a, a, a skills match. I, I think that, well, if, if you thought you heard that from me, uh, then I didn't do a very good job. Mm -hmm. uh, things are continuing to evolve. And now we're, we're, we're at a certain point in the, in the evolution where, where we need to keep, we need to maybe change the trajectory a little bit, but we're continuing to evolve. We've been evolving for a long time. Um, you know, maybe it's time to actually digest. Uh, we've moved so quickly. Maybe it's time to digest or figure out how all these changes can get us out of this mess in the next couple of years so that we can really take off. Things get better. I don't know. You know, we're also going on my design specs now. Yeah. <laughs> now that we're done with the strangeness of the presidential election, we're entering a mayoral election year. And there's only about an Oklahoma land rush of candidates running uh, all over the spectrum. Um, um, in terms of how much is that going to be? We only have a couple of minutes left. How distracting is that going to be? This is more of a city question. How distracting is that going to be by trying to apply the kinds of changes that we need to pull us out of the, out of the hole we're in? It won't be distracting. It's going to be helpful to a, a real policy debate. Where do, where do we want the city to go? What do we want our schools to look like? What do we want our economy to look like? And who do we trust most to build it? Will it be someone like a, a Ray McGuire? Will it be an Eric Adams, a D Diana Morales, a Lori Sutton, Scott, uh, Stringer. Scott Stringer? All those guys. Are, mm -hmm. will, what are they bringing to the table to lead New York City into the future of, of better schools, more effective schools, a, a better economy, a wider economy that lifts more boats? And to the press's concerns, feeding our children, those who are hungry, those who are homeless. Mm -hmm. So, but Michael, you were saying that uh, we need action. So I just hope that it's going to go beyond the debate, you know, that we really, because we can't wait for the elections. We got to, we, we need action now. We really need action now. So I hope that, yes, uh, we need to have those debates, but I hope that action and debates are going on at the same time. And then we can be running. We can't wait for a new mayor. We just can't. Um, take me, what, do you, what would you like to see happening in the short term? And we literally only have about 30, about 30 seconds left as we enter into our political year, coming out of the national political year. I mean, I think that we still need to go back into session. That's one of the biggest things on the state level that we need to do. We need to go back into session and we need to decide on revenue. That's for me, numero uno. <laughs> and revenue meaning? We need to start, we need, gen, we need to generate revenue. Care tax stock transfer tax, the kinds of taxes that Michael was talking about before. All of the things that we put on the table are just ideas, right? What we need to do is we need to figure out which ideas will work for folks and we need to just do them now. Like we're gonna be missing a whole year of revenue if we're not, if we're not actually taking that action this legislative session. And I apologize that of course the other side of the revenue is the, is the spending side. And of course, because we're all New Yorkers, we didn't, talk about the spending. We didn't talk about where we might have to make cuts in the, you know, in the kind of spending in order to, because you still have to balance the books. If we're a hundred million dollars in the hole, the state comes in and takes over the city. So, and the state cannot bail us out. So I think we're just about out of time. I want to thank you all. This is very, very spirited. This work is great. <laughs> I didn't really want to mute Michael because it's a, it's a, <laughs> a fool's errand, Michael. I understand that. <laughs> I don't want you, I don't want you yeah. muted. I want to thank you all very much, and we'll see you all next time on CUNY Forum. <laughs>